deGrasse Tyson, what's your drink? It's a Fonseca 1992 Port. 1992? From Portugal, 25 years old, a good can, vintage year four. Would you like to join Can me? I join you? Yes, yes please, that be okay? please. <laughs> that sounds interesting. I'm not a huge Port person. This is well, port one, is, of your, one of your favorites, port yeah? Port is heavy, and it's, you know, not all of life is, is thick and unctuous. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's, um, but and not all wine mm. serves every moment. That's really good. But it's <laughs> That's really good. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right, we're here to drink port, but we're also here to talk about you a little bit. We've known each other a little while. Mm -hmm. How did you... We almost go like way back. We go kind of back. back. Yeah. Kind of back. Kind of back. How did you get here to be Neil deGrasse Tyson, head of the Hayden Planetarium at the Natural History Museum, book author, TV star? I mean, I could keep going. You have a long so, resume. So some of it is just the job, okay? I'm appointed director of New York City's Hayden Planetarium, where I went as a kid. So there's a certain obligate, a certain duty I have in that position to try to have an influence on the next generation the way educators and scientists had on yeah. me. You went I, there as a kid. As a nine-year-old You grew kid. up in New York City. In New York, that was my backyard planetarium, the Hayden Planetarium. And so, so yes, it's, it's an awesome obligation and duty to serve as its director, and I don't take it lightly. Yeah. So that's that's the job. Right. The day job, right? So then, I also like to write. Yeah. It's very solitary in the moment. It's simultaneously solitary, but very public, because I'm trying to think, how are you thinking? Well, how are you going to receive this word, this And phrase? your book, that's your book. Your book's on the New York Times bestseller list right now. In this moment, it is number one on the New York Times bestseller but it's, it's minutes away from getting bumped by Hillary. Hillary oh. Clinton. Yeah, but okay. Well, but, all right. Uh, yeah, yeah. You got to... So, so. <laughs> if you're going to get beat. If I got to get beat. Presidential fine. candidate. Presidential okay. candidate. Fine. Um, but of the, this past summer, it's been 10 out of 20 weeks. Astrophysics at, at number, for people in a hurry. At number one on the bestseller list. That's amazing. Astrophysics. You got to pause there. Astrophysics for people in a hurry. Which is people like me. Yeah, yeah. People who we are... We don't have time. People who are curious, yeah. but just don't have time. So it's it's a slight volume, and it's 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 cu it's curated to have the most mind blowing stuff in the universe, all in this slim volume. So if you don't know much about the universe, or if you know a little bit and want to yeah. know more, oh my gosh, it's going to catapult you. And then maybe after that, you'll you'll get bigger books or yeah. watch documentaries and things. I love but, it, yeah. and I love it for my kids too. You know, the idea that science is accessible, that it's yeah. not some thing pie in the sky. It was never nobody... something pie in the sky. I think sometimes it's taught that way. Here's your science, take your medicine, right. and then when we're done, you're done. Right. And then you can sell the book back to the bookstore. Right. No. Or Learn the periodic <laughs> table. Right, right. Science is everywhere. It is all, it's part of us. It is in us. It is around us. And so a big part of what I've done professionally, or attempted to accomplish professionally, is alert people of how how ubiquitous yeah. science is. And once you realize that, then it's nothing to fear, it's something to embrace. How did you go from the kid who visited Hayden Planetarium to the guy you are now? I mean, is, is there a direct line? Did you know when you were that little kid oh, visiting? I, that... I knew when I was nine. No, but it would take two years to figure out that you could study the universe as a profession. Take a couple of years. So by age 11, that's when I knew. So you ask the kid, what's the annoying question adults ask kids? What's what that? do you want to be when you grow up? I said I want to be an astrophysicist. I had that an answer astrophysicist. from age 11 onward. Not an astronaut, which is what oh, most no. kids would say. An astronaut, no. In the day, well, astronauts were like boldly going where hundreds have gone before around Earth right. orbit. We went to the moon. Because you're a kid in the 70s, yeah? Uh, I, so I was aware of the 60s, yeah. but was a participant in the 70s. Yeah. So I, I saw what was going on. And, and for me, I, the large-scale universe is what attracted me, not so much just going around Earth orbit. Right, not and just the moon. We're all, or even just the moon. And NASA has convinced us that going into orbit is space. But if I had a schoolroom globe here, and I ask you, how far up is the space station orbiting? Like, yeah. what would you say? And so I've seen people put it out here. Yeah, yeah, no, that's what I would do. Yeah, it's three-eighths of an inch oh above the surface. Yeah. I'm an You're into that's the not space. vast that's not space. reaches of space. No, that's, that's as far away from Earth's surface as New York is from Boston. Wow. 
and I, you know, or, or New York from Washington, just, just it's a couple, couple hundred, 250 miles yeah. up. Yeah. That's it. So, so take me somewhere, take me somewhere far. I'd go to Mars. If you, give you me would? a good Netflix account, a few good books, <laughs> bring the fam. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd go to Mars. One day. Yeah, someplace, the moon, Mars, and beyond, but this low Earth orbit stuff, we got to grow up out of that. I feel like I have to ask this because you're an African American kid. Did anybody say like you can't be that? No, um, I grew up in a time later than that was said. Different things were said. Like they see my athletic talent, and they say, "Oh, you should be an athlete." Oh, but I want to be an astrophysicist. No, but wouldn't you rather be this other thing? So it's one thing to say you shouldn't be this, and it's another thing for everyone to push me in the direction of their own expectations. Mm. That's an evolution of this yeah. bias. Yeah. It's a lesser still form biased. of it, but it's still biased. <laughs> and I, had, I was deep enough so that none of these people's opinions mattered to me. And I had enough confidence and self-confidence. Uh, a confidence in the system, self-confidence, yeah. for me, that, no, I'm... You knew you could do I'm it. I'm going to become an astrophysicist, with or without them. Is it true that Carl Sagan, who people of a certain age remember really well, the Cosmos, yeah. the first Cosmos guy, mm -hmm. is it true that he calls you or he invites you to come visit him at Cornell? Yeah, yeah. So, so the way that happened was, uh, I'm in high school, and there were the various colleges I had been accepted to, and I'm trying to decide which one. And I get a letter in the mail from Carl Sagan. Uh, I showed the letter to my mother, she confirmed it was legit. So apparently the admissions office at Cornell had sent my application to Cornell to him to say, is this, you know, what, what should do we think? do? What do you think? Then he sent me this letter of invitation to help me decide whether I would attend Cornell or not. And so I went up there, I took a bus up to Ithaca. Yeah. And I went to Cornell, by the way. Oh, you full, did? Full disclosure. Oh my yes. gosh, oh yes. my gosh. Yes. Okay. So the rest of full the story disclosure. I'm a little bit now bummed it comes about. Out. Okay, she, I'm a little bit bummed because you don't go to Cornell. Oh, okay. so <laughs> you end up at Harvard. We, we told part of the story in Cosmos, but we didn't finish the story. Right. To finish the story, he invites me up, spend all afternoon visiting the lab, the thing. And then here's where things uh, became special for me. Uh, so first, <laughs> he's sitting there, and he reaches back and just doesn't even look. Pulls out a book, and it's a book he wrote. And I said, oh, that's badass. See, if you don't even have to look, whatever book your finger touches is a book you wrote. You wrote. Yeah. You wrote. And then he signs it, Dear Neil, a future astronomer, Carl. Do you still have I just, it? I said, of course, I still have that book. It's wrapped in plastic, and it's uh, on my shelf. I just, in fact, I looked at it last night, even. And I said to myself, if I'm ever remotely this famous in life, I will treat students the way he has treated me. And so it's shaped in large measure what kind of a scientist I became. I was already interested in the universe. So it's not like he got me interested in the, I was already there. Yeah. That's why they sent him the application. But the, the, the sensitivity to those who are in the pipeline yeah. is something that I attempt and try to succeed in every way to carry with me uh, to this day. It seems to me that one of the things that you are so good at is making science, making space, making astrophysics. It's accessible and interesting and relatable. And I mean, you're tweeting about, weren't you just tweeting about Game of Thrones? Yeah, just, just yesterday. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and you're relating it to Well, your I just work. thought people might want to know some physics. Yeah. Cause, so here's the thing. When I wake up in the morning, I don't say to myself, what am I going to tweet today? No. No, these are thoughts I'm having anyway. Mm -hmm. And Twitter is, an, is a medium in which I can share these pre-existing thoughts. But yes, I have to shape them. I usually tweet to 125 characters. So I sh I, it takes some shaping, yeah. but I'm having that thought anyway. I'm looking at Game of Thrones, and one of the dragons has blue breath. And I say, cool. Blue flame is like at least three times hotter than red flame. So if the producers know this and writers know this, that's some potentially interesting storytelling. You know, the a dueling flames, the red flame loses to the blue flame. Just every time. Every time. No question about it. And so if there's they somebody in Hollywood right now is re <laughs> rewriting a script. <laughs> if, they, if they know some physics, don't ever tell me you are constrained by the laws of physics. The laws of physics are liberating. They will put you in places you never even knew you could go. So don't even you know what uh, JBS Haldane once said, he's a uh, famous 
um, naturalist biologist. He said, the universe is not only a queerer than we imagine, it may be queerer than we can imagine. Uh, if, it's, if it's stranger than we can imagine, then that is the unlimited uh, uh, landscape of creativity, the, the actual natural universe. We, we came up with antimatter and black holes and the expanding universe and galaxies and space-time continuum. Start there and then take your, take your creativity. But don't start from below that and think you're going to invent something new. We got that, been there, done that. Okay, you got me started. Here's what you got to be. You, my favorite quote is from Mark Twain that I want to hand to artists, to every artist. The quote is, first get your facts straight, then distort them at your leisure. Message that, to Hollywood. Message to Hollywood. You know, the other thing With that... toast to that. To Hollywood. I want to know what you would tell a young person who's looking up at the stars right now and thinking, I want to be Neil deGrasse Tyson. I want to be like that guy. Okay. Uh, I would ask, what aspect of me is it that you want to be? That would be my first question. Do they want to know as much as I know about the universe? There's a track right there. You go major in physics or uh, astrophysics and get a PhD, this sort of thing. Uh, do you want to sort of reach for the public the way I have? Yeah. Well, then start writing very early and learn how to juxtapose words so that they have a certain sort of mellifluousness to the ear of the reader, the ear and eye of the reader. Think about that. Anyone who's literate can write, but if you just know things and you write them down, you might, that's just a wiki page that you're... And no one says, I just read this awesome wiki page. <laughs> I couldn't, <laughs> this wiki page was a page, right. page turner. Page turner. Right. No, no, no one ever says that because they're, they're just bluntly informational. And so. Do you think the tools are there for anyone who wants to gain the knowledge that you have and be an astrophysicist I think you to need, get that knowledge? You need to spend time around people who know more about stuff than you do. And that, that's not good for your ego. Your ego, hey, I'm good. No, you're not. There's somebody who knows more. And my Find greatest my greatest days are where I create something that I think is interesting or great, and I bring it to someone with more talent than I have, and they show me line by line, word by word, phrase by phrase, this is this doesn't work, this is slow, you can tighten this up, try this word, and it's like, whoa, and you walk out of the room in a new place. Plus, I would say, oh, if they say, Oh, I want to be like famous like you. I would say, okay, to whatever measure it is that I'm famous, I will say, nobody ever became famous being just like someone else. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. You gotta carve your own path. Was Michael Jordan a better version of someone else? No. He was Michael Jordan. Okay. Is Tom Brady a better version of something else? No, he's Tom Brady. Was Muhammad Ali a better version? Of, no, he's Muhammad Ali. Was Steve Jobs a better version? Of, no, he's Steve Jobs. Who was your role model? I didn't have one. Here's what I did. I knew enough about people that I didn't want to be any individual other person. But there were people who had talents that I wanted to have. Mm. When I visited the Hayden Planetarium as a kid, there's an educator. Look at his facility with words and sentences. And it makes me smile. If I'm ever an educator, that's the kind of educator I want to be. Look at that scientist. Look at the command of the subject that they have and how much they know. How do they ever know that? If I ever became a scientist, that's how much stuff I want to know. I look at my parents and say, look at their sense of morality and, and sense of justice. And if, and if I ever have to have think about what mm. that is, I want that to be a part of me. There's an athlete. Right. I want to be able to hit a baseball like that baseball player. I don't want to be that baseball player. I don't care about his life. And, and if he gets busted for cocaine and heroin, it doesn't matter to me because I didn't care about the rest of his life. Today, role models have to be this entire package. And I'm thinking, not only is that unrealistic, it may even be impossible. If I required somebody with my skin color coming out of the Bronx to become an astrophysicist before me, for me to become an astrophysicist, I would have never become an astrophysicist. There wasn't one. There wasn't one. So, if, so, so the role model concept, if you want it to work as, as, as potently as possible, 
then you should assemble your role models a la carte. Staple them together. Say, here is my uh -huh. assembled role model. Bits and, and pieces. That is what I did from childhood. There was no single person I wanted to be in its entirety. Star Talk. Yeah, thank you. National Geographic Channel, Sunday nights, yeah. 11 p.m. Eastern time. Yeah. You're starting a new run. And it's man, fourth season. It's the fourth season. Fourth season, and I was looking at By the, the way, Star list. Trek. The original Star Trek only went three seasons. So <laughs> you've got so to beat. I got it. We got some. We got Star something going Talk. here. Star Talk. Star Talk. You've got 20 new episodes. Yeah. Katy Perry. Katy Perry. Stephen Colbert. Kevin Smith. Kareem Abdul Jabbar. Mm -hmm. Those are just a few. And that's that's a pretty random looking it set is. right there. But what do they know about space? Nothing. Next question. <laughs> No, so it's not about what they, I'm not quizzing them about how much science they know. No, that's not how Star Talk works. They, they're an excuse for you to watch the show to then learn about science. So, so I'm talking with Kareem Jabbar. We talked about the physics of a basketball shot and how the angle that the ball comes in, the steeper that angle, the more of the cross section of the basket the ball sees. If you come in sort of at an angle like this, sure. the cross section is sort of foreshortened, as they say. But if the ball comes at, so he's, he's, he's seven feet and change, and yeah. then he extends his arm, which is another several feet, and then his fingers, that ball's going like straight down to the basket. No That's wonder physics. he never missed. That's physics. I don't want to say I could do it just knowing physics. It helps that you're seven feet four with arms that are, you know, yeah. that helps. But... Uh, what, what is physics the, is helping him. What's the biggest challenge you've had? I was kicked out of graduate school. You kicked were out. kicked out of graduate school? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a mismatch of who I was versus what they expected. Is this in Texas? Yeah, University of Texas. Um, there was a mismatch of all that I was versus what they expected a graduate student to be. I had a lot, of, in, in all fairness to them, in all fairness, I had a lot of sort of extracurricular things that I pursued coming out of college. I, I wrestled, I danced, I rode. I did just all these things, and I just kept doing that in graduate school. But you're not, you're not really supposed to. Graduate school is it's, it's supposed all, to be a little more serious. It's, yeah, it's all. It's, it's, you're so not, you, so you're not supposed but this to. Is so, interesting so it just it, didn't it, it work out. It must have been a huge setback at the time. Though. Completely, yes. At the time, you probably thought, yes. I'm never going to get there. Yeah, so I left graduate school, and I'm living in my parents' basement. Come on. Yeah, wait, wait, wait. Let me. Uh, but wait, there's more. Okay. <laughs> My girlfriend at the time uh, finished her PhD in Texas. She has a PhD in, had a PhD in mathematical physics. She came with me to New York, and we're both, and she doesn't have a job, but she's looking for a job. I don't have a job. I don't even have an institution. Right. We're both living in my parents' basement, and that's when I proposed to her. She's your wife now? Yeah, she's my wife now. How many years? Uh, 30 years, next year. So How do you there's get no over, lower point. How did you get over the setback? There is no lower point to propose to someone than in that moment. <laughs> yeah. it's I'm not, jobless. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I don't have a degree yet. Yeah, I'm, I'm married but because married of me. your degrees and your money and your. It's like no. Yeah. No, that was like the purest thing. How ever did you? How did you pick yourself back life. up? No, because I had none of these folks knew how deep I and the universe were <laughs> together. <laughs> me and the universe go way back and. I just kept at it. So I transferred my graduate studies to Columbia University. They accepted me. Here in New York. Yeah, so I lost a few years there just to jumpstart. And I got my PhD from there. And then I postdoc at Princeton. Yeah. And so, and just kept sort of ascending from there. But it's a great lesson, right? You didn't let it, you didn't let yeah, yeah. it so, de completely derail your dream. So there are two things. There's how much metal do you have, M-E-T-T-L-E, I think that's the right way yep. to spell it. How much metal, how much resolve do you have to overcome the challenges that life throws at you, whatever those challenges are. They could be at home, they could be your social, cultural, could be religious, whatever are those challenges, do you overcome them or not? And I think in the end, the people who succeed are the people who have failed mightily. Yep. Because they're the ones who figured out how to ascend from those ashes. It's a deep way to end. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> hey, this has been so fun. Well, thank you. Thank you. Hey. Thanks so much. All right. Really and two fun second. Yeah. 25 year old ports. Hey NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here. 
and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.